Okay, so here's the next issue in the battle for integration. And it's kind of ironic and on the one hand very witty and on the other hand very upsetting. Since you are a king in training, your job is to learn to rule on whatever it is you got here, whether it's a lot or a little, whether it's health or wealth or problems, whatever. Because once you're dead, you're going to have a whole kingdom of a lot of different people who are all below you, looking at you. Every minute of every day for the rest of eternity. And you are to be their hero. Because you learned Bible doctrine and they did not. That's it. That's your future. That's my future. That's their future too. But see, it's a question of whether we accept that future or not. You are a crown prince. You have the right to abdicate. Christ is God-man. He was the Messiah. He had the right to abdicate. Technically speaking, it is not a sin to abdicate. It is your free right. It would not have been a sin for him to say, No, Father, I don't want to go to the cross. Because he didn't commit any sin. We don't have exactly the same issue. Our issue is to grow up in Christ. And it is true that if you don't do that, if you refuse Bible and you abdicate, sooner or later, of course, you'll sin. Because Bible is the only way that you have to defend against sin. And if you refuse to lose, you lose. If you refuse to use it, you lose it. So. Sin comes in, but it's not technically due to your not wanting to inherit the kingship. Now, where do I see all that? Okay, where it says in Revelation, lest you lose your crown. Just search on the word crown. There are lots of churches out there in the United States anyway, who call it the crowns doctrine. It's in James, it's in Revelation, um, there are bits about it in 1 Corinthians 4. Just search on the word crown in the New Testament. And then talk to God. Use 1 John 1 9. Okay? There are churches out there that teach it. Some of them, I think most of them, are sort of like related to the Baptists. My pastor spent 50 years on it. He's not related to the Baptists. So it's not necessarily Baptists. I want to say that there was a church named Trap, T-R-A-P, or P. Maybe there's two P's in it. Or Travis, Travis. Its name was Travis, I think it was called Travis Bible Church, or Travis Baptist Church. They called it the Crown's Doctrine, too, so you can go talk to them. The point is that this is your situation. This is my situation, all of us. We're in what Paul called a long-term marathon race. Greek verb is treko. T-R-E-C-H-O, but the O in Greek is, looks like a W. So you can search on that in any kind of Bible software, which lets you search on the vocabulary term. It's a marathon race. Now, what is a marathon race? A marathon race is everybody starts out at the beginning, and then it's basically, can you make it to the end? Just, can you get there? Now, whoever gets there, there's going to be a first, a second, a third. But most people don't even get to the end. Not in a marathon race. It's how long can you go before you quit. And most will quit before they even reach the finish line. That's what we're all in. It's not really, we're not competing against each other. We're competing against ourselves. We're competing against the spiritual life. We're competing against all the... the vicissitudes of what comes throwing throwing at us from the demons, from other Christians, from unbelievers, from non-Christians who might be saved but they call themselves atheists or agnostic or Buddhist or whatever they call themselves. Okay? From society, from our bodies, everything. Do you make it to the end? Having, what was that? Having done all to stand. 
That's in, it should be in Ephesians 5 or 6. Okay? That's the idea. Thank you. Having done all to stand. Now, one of the, that's the battle. That's, you know, I'm sort of reviewing what I've said before. It's an internal battle. This battle is more important than anything that's happening in history. You know, we're in the middle of a presidential election right now. This is, the, I think, the 20th of January. It might be the 21st. And all those people who are on the stage and all the people, people constantly reporting on all the candidates think they're important. Their stuff, all the work on the planet, all the good deeds, all the money, all the talk, all the whatever, is worthless compared to one thought of Bible doctrine between sins that happens in your head. And God is, he, he, he's really adamant about this. Okay? I, I mean, it's expressed in the Bible so many different ways. My favorite verse on this is Isaiah 54, 1, which basically says, you know, shout with victory you who never bore kids, meaning you're sterile. In other words, according to the world, bearing kids is important. According to God, it's not. Christ never had kids. Isaiah 53, 8. He had no descendants. And who will who will announce his descendants? No one because he doesn't have any. Mi Yusoche is the Hebrew with my bad pronunciation. Who's gonna narrate? Me. Me, am I? Means who? Yesoche. Who's gonna do the narrating? And it's a it's a cultural word for narrating descendants. Because Christ doesn't have any descendants. So he won't have any sons saying, I'm the son of Christ. Yeah, because we all are the sons of Christ. That's what Isaiah fifty four one is telling you. Hi, the guy who didn't bear any kids because he bore your sins on the cross is gonna be bearing everybody. All of humanity is going to belong to him. And he's going to share out the booty of all those people to the strong, to the mighty, to the kings, i.e. you or me or anybody else who grows up in him. So yeah, it's a battle. And it's a pregnancy battle, which is internal. So Paul, typically, he's all hung up on pregnancy in all of his letters. Just talk to the scholars. They all know that. They're all kind of embarrassed about it. And I, what was it? Romans eight eleven, and following. He's basically saying life is a pregnancy. The earth is waiting to deliver in travail. It's called in the King James. Until eternity is born. That's when you take your office, or I take my office. Will we get to the finish line? Now, that battle, being internal, being inside your soul, is far more important and far more determinative of history. Analogous to the cross. Man, mal nafsho. Okay, that's Isaiah 53, 11, which is also a pregnancy passage. Christ was made pregnant, raped with our sins. Um, that's more important, obviously, than all the stuff that's going on outside. Now, the biggest, well, maybe not the biggest, but among the biggest battles you got to deal with. Every day. And for me, it's the hardest. I can't, I can't, I can't get past it right now. Is to understand that you're important. Your littlest thought is more important than all the good deeds on the planet from the beginning to the end of time. Your littlest thought of Bible doctrine is more determinative of history than anything and everything that happens. In fact, your thought births it. Now, is that because you're so great? No. It's because God is so great. It's because Bible doctrine means that much to him. 
he hears it. He hears it since eternity past. Remember, Matthew 4.4, 4, always occurring. You don't merely live on bread, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And who said that? Christ. It has what? An alternative to Satan tempting him to do something visible that was a good deed. Turn these, speak these stones into bread. You think Satan was only talking about enough bread for Christ to eat? No. Turn these stones. Speak is really what he said. Speak these stones into bread. Well, if he was hungry, he'd only need one loaf. Stones, plural. As my pastor liked to put it, Christ as God could turn the whole damn universe into gingerbread if he wanted. Satan, of course, knew that. It's first class condition in that verse, Matthew 4, 3. Speak these stones in the bread. Oh, please, don't be hungry. Speak these stones in the bread. So he's relying on, he's tempting. Christ, with his own godness, with his own importance, with his own role, to do something other than the invisible, still small voice, seeming to accomplish nothing, sitting there, doing nothing, waiting for the cross, the way however Father's going to determine it, rather than doing something about it. Each one of those three temptations is exactly the same kind of ploy. The second temptation was, hey, hey, jump down. Jump down from this high pinnacle I put you on, and everybody will see that you're the God-man, and they'll all worship you. And what did Christ say? Don't parizo, Greek word in my bad accent. Don't, Don't tempt God. Don't put God to the test. In other words, he's going to wait on Father to do it his way. However Father's going to prove that Christ is the Son of God to everybody else, he's, he's, that's what Christ wants, not Christ doing it himself. Well, Christians violate that rule all the time, just like they're constantly trying to turn stones into bread. Oops. Temptation number three. Kneel. That's what Satan said. Kneel before me. Actually, what he put, he reversed it. He says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you kneel. Which is sort of like acknowledging Satan's suzerainty over those kingdoms. And really what Satan's trying to do is tempt Christ to zap Satan into oblivion because Satan doesn't want to live anymore. Okay. Christ says, get away, go away. He didn't give in to the temptation to zap Satan. Now you and I, we'd give in to that temptation. We're trying to do it with each other all the time. We're trying to zap this problem and that problem and the next problem into non-existence. God is doing that. So what does that tell you about the importance of of Matthew 4.4, 4, first temptation reply, always occurring. And the second temptation, Christ's reply, is also scripture because Satan's twisting Psalm 91 in his justification. So Christ says, don't you tempt the Lord God. Because he's, you know, replying with scripture. And then the third one, he says, oh, go away, Satan. Now, that means that what goes on inside your head, because it's what went inside his head, is more important than what's going outside in the world. Period. Over and out. That's real hard to deal with. That's the biggest battle of all. At least for me it is. Maybe you got a bigger one you can think of. Let me know. I have a real hard time... Just sitting there looking at the ceiling like I am right now saying, I'm important. 
See, you get so enamored of the Bible and so enamored of God as you mature, you forget. It becomes a pleasure to say you're nothing. It's not being humble. It's not trying to belittle yourself. It's not trying to remind yourself to not be arrogant. It's a different kind of arrogance. You come to enjoy being a nobody. You come to enjoy being a nothing. You come to enjoy the fact that God's doing all the work. So now, because that's what he does with you, he takes you around Robin. He takes you into a a spate of stuff where you don't want to go. And then once you learn to love that condition he took you into, that you initially hated, once you learn to love it, he takes you out of it into a new area that you hate. And you get to the place where you love being able to say, I'm nothing. And it's really much more interesting and happy to be looking at someone or something else and to just disregard the self. The whole self thing is one great big albatross. I mean, I can't, I just, when I think back on the old days when I had to be important to myself, I'm like, God, what, what, how, I was constantly tied up in knots. Okay, well, now that I don't like that anymore, now he brings it back to the same old, but this time, why am I important? Why are you important? Same reason. Bible doctrine is in here. I mean, think about it. Every movie you ever watch, there's a hero and an antagonist. That's the basis for all movies, all stories, all literature, all struggle, all news, all everything. There's a protagonist and an antagonist. The protagonist is the hero. The antagonist is the enemy. You're supposed to cheer the protagonist and you're supposed to boo the enemy. Okay, well, you're the protagonist. You're God's protagonist. And why is that true? Because Bible doctrine is in you. What was that? Treasure in earth and vessels. It's uh, end of Romans 9. And of course, the, he's quoting Isaiah. Where was that? Isaiah 1 or 2 or 4 or 6. You can, you'll be able to find it if you've got a concordance. Treasure in earth and vessels. The treasure is Bible doctrine. True riches is Christ's person. Matthew 4, 4 always occurring because it's what God likes to hear. If God likes it, it's more important. God doesn't like all this wandering around, all this politicking, all these stupid Christians, especially the vile pro-lifers, sticking themselves in the politics, politicizing Christianity. That's Revelation 17, playing live on screen. You want to know how, you know, Revelation 17 is going to come true in the tribulation? Just turn on your television. Watch the people supporting Ted Cruz. Watch the people supporting Donald Trump. They're all dominionists. Which is a sect of Christianity that's out to take over the world. Just like the, is, you know, jihadists are trying to do. And except in Christianity and dominionism, it's supposed to be by, you know, political means. Not necessarily including physical war. Although I wonder about that. All that stuff is is apostate. All that stuff is Revelation 17. Ted Cruz, Revelation 17. Donald Trump, Revelation 17. Anybody pro-life, Revelation 17. Anybody say, playing the Christian card? Oh, I'm a Christian, so you should vote for me. That's Revelation 17. Go look. The word mystery is used for church. It says Babylon mystery. That's used for church. Musterion in the Greek. It means a doctrine known to those inside a group. And so it's a mystery to everybody outside. Paul's the guy who used that term. John plays on Paul. And specifically John is addressing what Paul wrote in the Greek meter 
of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. John, John builds Revelation pretty much around it. So first Paul wrote it, then Peter did it, and then John's writing to it. But I have to map that out so you can see it. it's going to take years to do if I live that long. John is playing back to Paul when he says the mystery of Babylon. Babylon wasn't a mystery. The word mystery for ch is used for church only, which Paul uses in Ephesians 3. Well, he actually used it in Ephesians 1, 9, which is where, you know, that's how come we find out it's church. Because that was when Origen went to the seven mothers in 217 AD, which is syllable 217 in Paul's writing. It's very clever. Very, very clever. Because that's when the whole so-called... Catholic Church doctrine started. It was sort of cobbled together, ex post facto, but that's when it started. That was the first time that that Peter was put on a pope list. It was in 217 AD. I've already documented that in the Paul videos. The book that proves that is in Bishop's List, and it talks about how Eusebius picked it out from Julius Africanus and a guy named Demetrius of Alexandria was against Origen and that was the 217 fracas between those two. I mean, it's documentable. The point here is that Revelation 17 was playing then. But it wasn't called Revelation 17 then. When Paul wrote it, that was... You know, 50, 58, 59 A.D. Revelation 17 was penned in about 88 A.D. by John. Okay. And I prove why we know that it was 59 and 88 in their own meters. That's all in LukeDatelineMeters.pdf. The point is that this kind of thing tells you the real history. The real history is accruing and occurring due to Christians learning or refusing to learn Bible doctrine. Now you don't learn Bible doctrine just because you study Bible. You have to be between sins and under your right teacher and learning and living on Bible talking to God about it. Okay? You know, I've talked, I mean, how much and how often, that's something between God and you to determine. It's not a denomination, it's a process. And it's a matchup between whoever's your right teacher and you. And if you're not doing that, you're out of the system, you're cursing to your nation, to your family, to your region, to your neighborhood, to everybody, including yourself. Okay, but there, most Christians are out of it. They're not doing that. So they're cursing the world. That's why the world is in turmoil right now. That's Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So that's where the real history is. So now come back to the, the topic. I am important. That's the battle. You think you're important in the beginning. You find out that you're a potz. And you learn to revel in the fact that you're a potz. So what was that? Second Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Okay? That's Paul's talking about how he's nothing. Okay, my strength. What was it? My strength is made. My pastor's translation is, my strength is made operational. Weakness, the actual verb is teleo, and it means my strength is made complete, brought to completion in weakness in that passage. And then Paul says, well, then I'm going to boast in my weaknesses, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I'm weak in myself, which is always, then I'm strong in Christ, which is God's power. You come to the point where you revel in that. And as soon as you do, or sometime soon after you do, then he takes you back and says, wait a minute. Now you're happy that you're nothing. So now I'm going to make you something. And you have to deal with that too. And what do you do to Paul? Paul had the thorn in the flesh, learned to exalt in the flesh, and what did God do to him? Made him important. So what is God doing to you? What is God doing to me? And what is our role in the body of Christ anyhow? We determine history. Not Donald Trump, not Ted Cruz, certainly neither one of them. 
they wouldn't know Bible if it bit them. None of the pro-lifers, they're totally carnal, all of them. Oh, Liberty University, Oral Roberts, they're all carnal. If you're all trumping around, voting for some candidate, you rah, 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 my presidential candidate, marching on Washington, we're going to march for life. No, you're marching for Satan. But the person who's sitting there quietly, or maybe not so quietly, learning and living on Bible, that's my arrogance, learning 1 John 1 9, studying on your right teacher, that's the person who's determining history. Because God likes it that way. He's got a real wicked sense of humor about this. We saw, what was it, Isaiah 54 1, sterile bearing kids. Okay, um, Isaiah 64, 6. Your righteousnesses. He just said righteous deeds. Are menstrual rags. Do I need to explain what that is? The best of what man can produce in God's eyes. Or stinky bloodstained cloth. Which is what? When the ovum doesn't have sperm. In other words, no different from an abortion. That's man's righteousness. Go look it up. The actual Hebrew word there is nidah. There's a whole book in the Talmud about it. Misinterpreting it, of course. Because the Jews forever are thinking that their good deeds count for something. In spite of knowing the meaning of Nida. In Isaiah 64, 6. So all their good deeds mean nothing. But one little Bible thought between sins. That's Matthew 4, 4 always occurring. It can be occurring in you. It can be occurring in you if you're sitting on the toilet. It can be occurring in you if you're paraplegic. It can be occurring in you if you're in a hospital bed. It can be occurring in you when you're barely conscious. Because maybe you got drunk at a party. Now you use 1 John 1 9, you're between sins. And you think Bible doctrine. And of course, the Christians seeing you be hung over looking at you saying, oh, that's not a Christian. You're not saved. And yet what you're thinking at that moment, because you're between sins with whatever the Bible is in your head, or just being between sins, is worth more. And that other Christian is sinning. God's got a wicked sense of humor like that. Remember when, thank you. Rem, oh, wow. Remember when Christ talked about the, wid the widow with the two coppers? The guy in front of her put in what's called a talent, which is like, I don't know, a million dollars or something in today's money. And she put in two what were considered pennies in their day. And what did he tell the disciples? She put in more than them. The guy before her. The value of what she put in was more than the guy who deposited so much. Why? Because he gave in order to be seen. Because he gave out of his, like, surplus. She gave all she had. It's not because she gave all she had. It's the attitude. Well, I've only got two pennies left. If God wants to kill me, he'll kill me. Here. Here. She was glad to give what she had left. It was her attitude. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what's going on inside her head then is worth more than what's going out into the collection plate. So let's say you don't have any money, but you want somebody to get money, then pray for it. 
If that somebody is you, pray for it. If that somebody is somebody else, pray for it. But the harder thing to live with is, hi, you're that important. I, he's, I have to practice this every day and I'm not doing it well. I have to walk around all day now when I don't like this doctrine saying, I'm important, I'm important, I'm important. It's not what's going on outside, it's what's going on inside. And I fail all day long. You can understand why. You finally learn not to care about yourself. You finally don't have an ego anymore. And now, psh, that's when he hits you. You've got to re respect your important. I mean, understand, it's like, it's like being born, because it really is. It's being born in a royal family. From the minute you can start to think they train you over and over and over. You're a prince. You're a king to be. You're a prince. You're a king to be. You're a princess. You're a queen to be. You're a king to be. You're never allowed to forget that. You don't think that that's not annoying? The minute Christ is born, he's never allowed, as it were, how can he? He can't afford to forget. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. It all depends on me. It all depends on me. It all depends on me. Every single thought I have has to be controlled. What was that? Second Corinthians 10.5, of course, the screen. Bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. Well, as Christ, I'm the Messiah. Everything depends on what I'm thinking. It doesn't depend on what's outside. It depends on what's inside. That's a battle that, that's, you know, every single second. How do you come to grips with that? Now, your typical Christian, brotherfoot Christianity, has this fake humility. Oh, I'm low. That means I'm good. That means you're arrogant is what it means. You're not allowed to be low. You're bride of Christ. Yeah, okay, the bride is composed of untold millions of people. But you're no less bride because you're just one. That's a hard thing to live with. I'm bride of Christ. He's my husband. And I mean, you know, maybe your male gender, but think of it as the role, okay? You know what a, a wife is supposed to be. Okay, so now you know how you're supposed to relate as an office. I'm bride of Christ. That's who I am. You're bride of Christ. That's who you are. You're no less bride of Christ because I too am bride of Christ. Because he's big. You see the point? Kingship is big. So I'm big. You're big. It's not fun. It sounds like it's fun when you're like two years old. Oh boy, I get to be king and I can tell everybody to do whatever I want. Yeah? And once you actually are king, it's like everybody is clinging on you. And they really are. Because they're your kids. They don't know what to do. They need a head. You're the head. They're the body. Guess what? That's not fun. The hardest part of this whole job is to recognize that you're important. That everything hangs on you. So all this time, the sin nature wants status and importance and power. And, oh, I'm good. Oh, I think well of myself. blah -de blah And look at the irony. Remember I said in the beginning, this would be ironic? The irony is, is God is making you important. Everything the sin nature ever wanted, God gives you. The first second you believe in Christ. Think about it. 